Welcome, everyone. Mary Davis Fournier, Deputy Director of the ALA Public Programs Office here. Thank you for attending today's distance learning session, Hosting and Using Innovation Spaces. This session is part of ALA's Libraries Transforming Communities Initiative, which addresses the critical need within the library field by developing and distributing tools and resources, such as today's webinar, to support the work of engaging communities in new ways. Through this initiative, ALA seeks to strengthen the role of library professionals as core community leaders and change agents. ALA is partnered with the Harwood Institute for Public Innovation for this important and wide-ranging initiative based on their approach of turning outward to affect community change. This initiative is made possible through a grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. A few technical reminders at the top of the webinar for everyone. Should you experience any technical difficulties during the webinar, please send a private chat message to Brian Russell. You can do this by scrolling to his name in the upper right corner of the monitor and uh, selecting private chat or start chat with Brian. Please use the chat box, the, the one that has everyone in front of it. To pose questions during the session, our facilitators and project staff will monitor the chat box and your questions will all be answered by the end of this webinar. This session is being recorded and the archived version will be available at ala.org forward slash LTC under professional resources. We'll also post it to the Libraries Transforming Communities uh, Public Innovators Cohort ALA Connect group. Feel free to share it with your fellow team members and peers who may not be able to make this webinar but are interested in this work. Please have the Innovation Spaces tool at hand. Uh, page references at the bottom of slides throughout the PowerPoint refer to page numbers in the Innovation Spaces PDF that you, if you do not have in hand right now, can access by following either of these two links on the screen in front of you. And our facilitators for today's session are Jan Elliott and Carlton Sears, both certified Harvard coaches. And we'll also be hearing from three members of the Libraries Transforming Communities Public Innovators cohort today, Sean Brommer with the Columbus, Wisconsin Public Library team, Erica Freudenberger from Red Hook, New York Public Library, and Richard Frieder with the Public Library of Hartford, Connecticut. And with that note, I'm going to uh, mute my microphone and hand off to Jen Elliott, who will kick off today's learning session. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks, Mary. Um, <clears throat> we'll just, uh, I'll just start with a quick overview of what we're going to do today. Mary has already uh, told you a little bit about um, what we have planned. We're going to remind everybody uh, about what an innovation space is, and then we're going to walk through um, the steps to holding innovation spaces and um, some key characteristics that we find useful to remind people of. Um, we will also uh, talk through the six steps to keep in mind as you're planning and doing an innovation space, and we will turn to your colleagues after this to uh, hear their experience, their experiences in trying out innovation spaces uh, to this point. And then we'll end with tips to address common questions, uh, everything from facilitating the conversation, tips for taking notes, how to make time in a busy schedule, and things like handling meetings when partic some participants are unable to attend or can only attend uh, every other time or something like that. So we'll get really practical as we go through this. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm going to start us off by uh, taking a look at the innovation space cycle that we all, uh, those of us who are at the lab met and those of us who have uh, seen the binders since then. Just as a quick reminder of where we are at in this process and where innovation spaces fit in. Um, 
We've all spent a, a chunk of time on number one and their circle underneath number one on with the intentionality practices that um, are all about developing a mindset and an ongoing practice. Um, that Both of those are really, really important and it's, I just want to emphasize those again. And uh, decisions that are made using the Harwood practice are grounded in those three foundational concepts in the circle, turning outward, the aspirations, uh, what kind of community do you want and does the community want, and thirdly, the three A's of public life, authority, authenticity, and accountability. So they're the foundational practices. You're all doing some work with those. Um, Step number two, I guess one other thing I want to say is that <clears throat> just a reminder that the turning outward piece of this is critical and it is a deliberate choice to uh, turn outward towards the community and to gather public knowledge which, and use that public knowledge in decision making. That is under number two, gathering public knowledge. Um, we have spent um, webinar number one uh, outlining community conversations and webinar number two on theming and using public knowledge. Uh, both of those fall under number two, gathering public knowledge. And today we are going to work on holding innovation spaces, the number three in the cycle. Um, and that's just a reminder that um, Public knowledge is only useful when you learn from it and allow it to influence the decisions that you need to make as an organization. So um, hence the um, number three and number four, which is holding innovation spaces, which are all about learning, and number four, um, which is um, sharing of the public knowledge. There are also implications for partner selection and that's our next webinar in September. So um, I just wanted to help situate on where we are on the innovation cycle and how it fits in with gathering public knowledge and sharing public knowledge. Just a quick reminder of the turning outward proposition. Um, you've all realized by now that it's uh, much easier to say than to necessarily stay turned outward. But I will just remind us all of the value proposition, which is if we turn outward towards the community and become more intentional in our choices and judgments in creating community change, we will have a greater impact and increase our relevance and significance in communities. So uh, it's easy to say that. It's not so easy to make it happen and so um, this is what today's uh, webinar is about and what innovation spaces are basically about. Um, the kinds of meetings and conversations that um, we're used to having in our organizations typically focus on what we need to do, planning, strategy, activities, to-do lists, etc. And that, if we're not mindful, can pull us inward. And so what the innovation, spool, innovation, space tool, spool, <laughs> innovation space tool does is help us stay turned outward. And it invites us into quite a different kind of conversation, one that is focused on learning and innovation and thinking about possibilities for how we can work together. So just a quick reminder uh, for all of us, um, an innovation, the goal of an innovation space is learning, um, not planning or not assigning tasks. Uh, those of you who are at the lab will remember the exercise we did distinguishing between planning and innovation. Uh, the main question in an innovation space is what are we learning? It is not what do we need to do? And this is a tough habit to break, you guys. Um, think of it as an opportunity for your team to create shared insights and to brainstorm about what you're learning and to be in that space of reflection and learning. And you should 
leave an innovation space with some insights that, that have implications for what you do. The behaviors that you're looking for are a commitment to learning and exploring implications and acting on those implications. Changing the slides. Steps to holding an innovation space. Okay, here's I did. Tell, I promised you we'd be going over the steps. So here we go. We've got uh, five of them here. Um, participation and attendance. Um, the very first thing, and those of you who've already done this will know that yet you're all, you have to think about who do we need to participate. And the key factor here is um, what other parts of our organization do we need to move forward with us on this? And that's what the important way to think about who should be in an innovation space, um, especially as it relates to the Harwood practice. If, you're, if you are doing the innovation space on the Harwood practice, then that's critical. The other important thing to note here is we've all got busy schedules, et cetera, so it may be hard to get everybody to attend at the same time. So uh, if you're just starting out with innovation spaces, people will, m might not be used to the value of spending time on learning. So that's just keep that in mind. You're building a muscle again. That you have, uh, you're building many new muscles in this practice. So don't let the fact that everybody can't come to the your first innovation space or an innovation space get in the way of you doing them. Just get on with it, build the muscle, and begin to learn how to do an innovation space well. Um, I think one of the things that uh, I should say as well is we've learned that those organizations that implement innovation spaces early on in their Harwood practice are much more effective at accelerating their progress. So I really, really encourage you to get these started if you haven't already and get them into your schedule. The second step just this, is the opening and the welcome. Um, here you're going to just do what will come uh, naturally to some of you and uh, just remind everybody the purpose of the hour that you've set aside, um, especially if you're just getting started with this and building the muscle. Um, it's an hour to focus on what you are learning. Um, the conversation will inevitably at the beginning shift to doing uh, as you get used to this because that's the kind of meeting we're used to being in. So just make note of the ideas that people have and uh, offer to come back to those later. Don't be surprised if it takes several meetings uh, for participants to get used to um, what a learning meeting is, an innovation space is, and to become comfortable with this. But just stick with it, because it will become easier. Um, be sure uh, to remind everybody at the beginning, I just said this earlier, so I won't say it again, but what I do need to say is, Review the ground, ground rules um, because that's important to creating the right kind of environment. And the next slide is going to be on ground rules, so just hang on. Hope you're following me through the, the book here. So the ground rules, you've seen these before. Um, kitchen table conversation, no right answers. Keep an open mind and keep the discussion on track um, and have fun. I think the, uh, the um, important thing to think about here is that you all have a really strong meeting, to-do meeting kind of muscle. And so you're going to need to help each other out. And the facilitator in particular is going to be, have to be aware of and conscious of keeping this on a learning track. And so the, when it does slip into doing and to-dos, just make some notes and um, say you'll get back, you can come back to that in, in another meeting where you discuss um, the to-dos related to the conversation. Um, the fourth step is 
the critical, very, very critical, and that is what are the key questions that we want you to focus on in this, and you've all seen these before. Um, you can expect to spend um, most of the time on the first two bullet points, possibly the third. Um, and uh, we'll say this again and again. People are going to start out tentatively, so just be patient as they tr they try to figure out, and um, it will gain momentum over time. It's just really typical. You might find that uh, folks start out with more tactical kinds of observations. Um, you know, like something like a particular piece of software isn't working as it should, or something like that. Um, Acknowledge those things and make note of them, and, and at the same time encourage people to go deeper. You might, for example, ask if there's anything, is there anything that you've learned that may be strategically important and why? Use those kinds of questions to go deeper and help folks think more deeply about what's going on here. The idea is to keep the conversation going uh, and flowing, and you'll find that it'll flow between what are we learning and why is this important quite naturally. Um, when you go to shift to implications, there may be a pause, and again, quite natural. So just take some time to acknowledge the prog progress that's been made you know, by applying what you've learned in previous innovation space meetings after you've done a few. It adds legitimacy and reminds people of the value of taking the time for this kind of a practice. Harvest what you've learned. The fifth step. You know, here's where you want to, uh, and again, we have some very specific questions here. Um, it, you probably need to give folks some time to collect their thoughts. Um, what do you mean, harvest what you've learned, you know? And that's where you just work with them on what insights did this conversation spark for them. Um, and what do we want to make sure we carry forward for the next time? Make sure you write down what the group comes up with. This is really important because you want to carry these learnings forward and you want to be able to post them somewhere we're in a boardroom or wherever you're meeting, where folk can see them and remind themselves of what came out of the learning space, the innovation space. Um, again, identifying where you can use what you're learning, which is the third question there, that helps build accountability in for the team members. We're learning, so what do we do with that? How does it affect what we are uh, going to be doing here? What do we need to do with it? Um, and it gives you an opportunity to talk about what you see changing when you come together for the next innovation space. The sixth step is closing. Again, this is one hour. Keep to that time uh, frame so people know that it's a commitment for an hour, no more, and you'll get really used to timing yourself for these. Uh, and it helps people honor the time and set it aside. Um, if, make sure you don't leave an innovation space before you've scheduled the date and time of the next one. Um, that you get it done, it's in people's calendars, and you can move on. If you need to identify someone in the room to reach out, out to others that you, you feel or think need to be part of the conversation in the future. Don't leave that. Have somebody, tap somebody on the shoulder, have somebody uh, reach out to those who weren't in the room that you would like to see in the room. Um, okay, so that was a really, really fast look at the six steps related to holding an innovation space. The, the second half of the webinar is going to move on to discussing the key characteristics of an innovation space and remind us all of innovation and planning behaviors and the distinctions, as well as some tips for things that commonly come up and some questions that typically come up around uh, innovation spaces. But just before we do that, we're going to hear from some of you who've been doing innovation spaces, and I'm going to turn it over to Carlton for that. Carlton? 
Yeah, thanks, Jan. And um, what we're going to do is, um, as Jan said, have a few people share with you their experience. And then we're going to pause for questions uh, following each one of them. And then we're going to have a general pause for anything that's come up so far before we move on to the second half. So the three people we're going to hear from, uh, Mary Davis Fournier has already introduced them, uh, Sean Brommer from Columbus, Wisconsin team. Uh, she's the Youth Services and Outreach Consultant for South Central Library System. Um, Erica Frudenberger, from the Library Director from Red Hook, New York. And Richard Frieder, Community Engagement Director from the Hartford Public Library team. And we're just going to go through them one by one. And I'm going to turn it over initially uh, to Sean. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Can you all hear me? I'm yes. assuming that you can. Thanks, Carlton. Well, it's a gorgeous day here, um, actually, in my office in Madison, Wisconsin. We're finally seeing and experiencing some warm summer weather, and we'll take it here in the frozen northern tundra. Um, I was really happy when Carlton asked somebody from my team to talk about our very first innovation space, um, which we held earlier this month on August 4th. And what we found with our innovation space is that for us, it was a very natural and it was a very easy process. And it felt very familiar. Um, the participants in our innovation space was our team. It was Cindy Fessmeyer, the director, Bruce Smith um, from our state agency, Mary Lou Sharpie, who is a board member and a volunteer at the Columbus Public Library, and me. So we met at the administrative office of the South Central Library System in a room right across the hall from where I'm sitting right now. Uh, this is a, a very central location, and we were in a very basic meeting room, one where we've had a lot of our meetings, one where we've gathered for most of the webinars that we've participated in together. So for us, it was a very familiar space. It was very comfortable, but it also was a place where we couldn't be interrupted with phone calls or questions, especially for Cindy, the director, or for Mary Lou, who um, has literacy students, adult literacy students, who she uh, meets at, with at the library. So we were in this place where we could all leave the piles on our desk and leave our offices behind and gather in a neutral and familiar place. We were very intentional with the process. When we determined our date in July, we just said we need to have an innovation space. We're not going to talk too much about what this innovation space is. We didn't have any outcomes. We didn't have any goals or objectives. We just put it on our calendars. And um, as I said, we were very intentional then when we met with the actual process. We had our training binders with us. And um, we were quite aware, and we were very cognizant of time, so that we kept it to one hour. We identified a note keeper, and that was Bruce. And he took notes throughout our innovation space and then popped them into a shared Dropbox as soon as our innovation space was meeting was meeting was over. Cindy kind of facilitated, but we it was a very natural discussion, and I'll get back to that in just a second. And um, we reminded our, each other at the get-go that this was not about problem solving. And I'll be talking more about that later. The first thing that um, I'd like to talk about is that we found that the binder and that chapter 9 was very crucial to our process. And the process is so important, to trust the process and to go with the process. And we started with the ground rules. And even though we're all familiar with the ground rules, that we've all been talking about them now in our different co community conversations, that as participants, we got to be participants in the innovation space. So we got to spend time rereading them. And that we provided some time and space for questions about the ground rules as participants and not as facilitators. And that felt very new and refreshing for me as somebody who has facilitated so many different types of programs, not only the community conversations, but in other aspects of my job, that we got to participate and the rules applied to us. 
So these ground rules we found were very um, <laughs> grounding. <laughs> they were very, um, they were, helped us stay focused on our task. So we started with the four key questions on page 9.5, the process and the questions directed our conversation. And these questions provided a great foundation for us, um, for a group that we've already created our own culture. And it allowed us to maybe step back a little bit from the culture and from the ways that we've been communicating to really focus on the task at hand. And the questions kept us on task, and they kept us on topic. And this is where I want to emphasize the beauty of the process, that there is freedom and flexibility within the well-designed well structure of the innovation space. So trust the process. And we found that addressing the key questions um, very, was a very natural transition to the final discussion about insights and about what we want to carry forward to the next time, which has already been set. We're meeting for another innovation space on September 4th, um, actually right before our coaching call with Carlton. Um, I'm going to go back to process or emphasize process again, that looking back on our experience, I found that our innovation space was a time when we all seemed to reflect and to refer back to our experiences in Denver, that this was about us again, and this was about our experience, and that we referred time and time again back to our training and back to the lab. A few times we made statements such as, oh, remember when, re when Carlton referred to the cycle of public innovation graphic? We're now at step three, that we revisited our training. We reminded ourselves, it's OK that we're quiet right now. Remember what Carlton said, that we need to be, go to be zen with the silence. We could see not only where we are um, in our own process, in what um, we have planned, but we see where we are in the entire, entire cycle of public innovation and in the process of our shared endeavor of all, uh, all of our libraries working together to turn outward and to um, help transform communities. So for me, it felt like a very personal experience that I was able to reflect and apply toward everybody, all of our um, shared experiences. What makes the innovation space unique, uh, what makes it beautiful and special is that we found that this was about us. This was about our learning. And we actually reminded our, uh, ourselves a few times that, um, that this experience was about our learning and that it was not about planning and it was not about addressing issues. This was not about solving problems. And let me tell you, we're all problem solvers in our group. So for a group of problem solvers and for a group of resolution finders, this was a very new and refreshing experience that this was about what we're learning, not about the planning. I found that this was a very different type of discussion and work for us. And it felt very natural after we relaxed as a group and after we focused very much on the learning and to not always jumping ahead to the next steps, to the next plan. And personally, I felt that the learning portion the, the intentional learning of the innovation space and that personal self-reflection went hand in hand. That my experience was that there was this shared experience of learning. We were learning from each other in the, the innovation space. And that there also has been a personal experience of reflection about the process and about the project um, after the innovation space. And what this has allowed me to do as a participant in this program is that it's allowed me to begin to create a very personal definition of the type of work that we're doing and what I bring, what Sean brings to the work and what I am learning from it. Um, and for in a lot of aspects, I, I'm really just beginning to process that right now. We haven't been doing this for so long, but I'm now seeing that there are very um, wonderful personal implications from this process.
It's also allowed me to reflect on how I'm using Harwood methods in other aspects of my job and with other groups. Once again, the freedom within the foundation of the process works. There's flexibility in it, and there's a lot of freedom in the process, in everything that's laid out for us. It felt good to talk and to listen and to learn and not have to plan or solve anything. And it also felt very celebratory. We were able to identify the progress and activities that we've done so far this summer. And I'm really proud of, of our group, of what we're doing and what we're learning from each other. Thank you, Sean, very much. Um, I just want to pause at this point and see if anybody has any questions for Sean or of anything maybe that's come up so far. You can just put them into your chat box there. And um, I can provide a very brief summary on some of the insights um, that we came up with. I, I didn't really, I talked about the process and about our experience, and I didn't really talk about the highlights of our discussion. Um, so what we are learning and what we learn from each other is that people want to talk. They really want to get together and talk, and they want to help identify other people to be part of the discussion. And we're sensing that there's a change in the energy, in the energy in the community, that community members are beginning to hear about this project. They're beginning to hear about the conversations that are taking place. And they were even aware of the questions, the actual the ask exercise, which happened at an ice cream social earlier this summer. So people are aware that this is happening. We're also learning that some of the library staff members need a little extra help talking about the project. And we're now some of our next steps will be to come up with a definition of what we're doing. And that's OK. And some of the most powerful insights that we gathered um, that were sparked was that um, the, the, a very clear insight was that words are powerful, that people want to talk, and that some people don't feel that they have the opportunity to do that very often. Well, thanks very much, Sean. Any any questions for um, Sean, the Columbus team, what they've been doing, or for that matter, any questions so far that have come up in the in the webinar so far? Uh, we've got one person typing here, so we'll pause for a minute as um, before we move on to Erica. So Erica's question is, um, how many community conversations have you completed, Sean, uh, before doing the innovation space? And did you reflect on the process itself? Or were you also bringing in some of the things that you learned from participants? So yeah, yeah. We have had, um, and Mary Lou, correct me in the chat if I'm wrong, I think we've had four or five community conversations before doing the innovation space. We actually met after the innovation space. We had a separate planning time. So we kept our planning very separate. But because ideas came up through the innovation space, we wanted to address those issues. And we've now identified a bunch more community conversations that we need to plan and we need to have. Um, and the second part of the question, reflecting on the process itself, what I feel we did is that we really brought in the things that we learned from the participants. That's what we focused on. It wasn't until after we went through the actual process of the innovation space that I began to reflect on the strength of that actual process. So we were focused on what people have told us and what we've learned from people and not the process. Great. Anybody else have questions for Sean? OK, well, let's move on then. Thank you very much. And move on to Erica and from Red Hook. And maybe you share with us a little bit of your experience with Innovation Space. Um, hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm here with Brent, so he might chime in as well. Um, <laughs> so um, we met, just for the particulars, we met in what we call our clean room, which is a nice, bright room behind the children's room. 
and it was open to the public. It was during an afternoon, though, so it wasn't a particularly busy time. Um, we we mostly talked about how great it feels to be doing this work and how much fun we were having, and how at, at that point we held this on I think it was like July twenty fourth, the last week in July, and we talked to just about a hundred people between the ask exercises, um, the Brent and Olivia were doing door to door, and the aspirations exercises that we were doing with various groups from the Economic Development Committee and um, Chamber of Commerce to Historic Red Hook and other groups in town, Red Hook together, and two community conversations. And what we, we were mostly talking about what we had seen and overheard, and that was that people we were talking to were really excited to share their thoughts and listen. And almost universally, I would say, that we were thanked for asking them the questions and for engaging them in conversation, which was really nice. I mean, I kind of felt like we would be putting people out, but that was not the question. Brent can talk a little bit about that. So it seemed like people were, were genuinely um, appreciative of the fact that we could ask them questions about how they could talk about the community, what kind of community they wanted to live in. And the ass exercises actually went on for about a half an hour because they were maybe longer. So we just trying to find out what we learned from just that particular exercise and how whatever the situation that we see if there's some kind of Brent and Erica, where you are breaking up. We are having trouble hearing you. Oh, so sorry. Okay, we'll we'll talk more directly into the microphone. Yeah, that's good. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, so we found it to be, so far, all of our experience. I mean, this is less, of, I guess, about the innovation space. What we were doing was reflecting on the work we've been doing. So I hope that was the right thing. Um, but we've found that it's just been a great opportunity to better know the community and to find out how engaged and energized our community is and to identify people who really genuinely want to be involved in making change and who are actively asking what the next steps are. And we did talk about how we feel like there is a momentum starting to grow. People are beginning to talk about it beyond our cohort. Like people are starting to ask questions like, hey, what is this you're doing? What are these conversations you're having with people? And we're starting to see patterns emerge. Um, a couple of issues did arise for us. Of course, because of who we are, we kept trying to slip in a little bit of planning. Um, and we were we tried to be very strict and bring it back to learning and set up planning. Um, but try to figure out how what the best ways we could share what we're learning because that's what people want to know. Like, when are we going to hear back from you? When when do we take action on this? And everybody's all ready to go. And also thinking amongst ourselves about how rethinking how we meet and communicate because we're all involved in a lot of different groups and we spend a lot of time in meetings. And it's about, Brent and I were just talking, it's about the same couple dozen people in all these meetings. So is there a more efficient way to do this that we don't burn people out, but get the information out and keep these relationships without having a bazillion meetings? And just in general, talking about how do we move the needle forward? How do we get to where we're going while still honoring the history and understanding the history of our village? And we then we ended up thinking about how can we improve what we're doing and we thought that maybe one piece that we were missing is that we weren't adequately thanking the participants, that we could send um, follow-up thank you notes and you know, start planning on when we can actually share some of the information we've been gathering. But we did not actually plan any time to share it or how we were going to share it, so we stopped ourselves. But um, that's pretty much where we are. I don't, Brent, do you have anything to add? No? OK. That's it for us, folks. Hey, um, any questions for um, Eric or Brent? No? OK, let's move on to Richard then from Hartford. Uh, hi, everybody. Hope you can hear me. Um, we uh, have been working a little bit with innovation spaces. What's the plural of innovation space? Is it innovation spaces? I don't know. That's a that's what we've been saying. 
Um, anyhow, and I'll, I'll tell you where we are. Um, we're really excited and have been really from the beginning, from, from when we were all together in Denver, about innovation space as a tool that we can use um, library-wide to hopefully have a positive influence on our organizational culture to, to create more a culture of learning and a culture of innovation. Um, I'm happy to say that we already, I think, uh, have a pretty healthy culture in terms of, of learning and innovation, but uh, we, we certainly can do a lot better. So we think innovation space can help us get there. So um, what we did, this, this is going back to June now, and by the way, I should say before I forget that we have not yet done a community conversation, and that's for a variety of reasons, most of them having to do with scheduling and vacations and everything else. So the previous two speakers, to some degree, talked about kind of integrated community conversation and innovation space. I'm not going to do that because we haven't done a community conversation yet. We have one planned for um, next month. Um, but uh, we really wanted to stick our toe in the water with innovation space and just sort of try it out uh, as kind of a pilot. So we did one back in June. Um, we had about 10 or 12 library staff in the room from um, a variety of places in the organization. A couple of us in the room were on, on the LTC team, but um, the majority of people were not and really were not, you know, obviously had not been to Denver, had not heard much about this project. So they didn't have that context. And that was, um, in a way, good and in a way, uh, a challenge. Um, we chose the topic of circulation of ebooks. The, the topic, it could have been any topic. We just wanted to uh, play with the, with the innovation space method and just to see what it was like. So the topic was circulation of ebooks. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about, about what we learned from that. But before I do, I'll just jump ahead and say that since then, what we have decided to do is start doing an innovation space on a monthly basis. Our, our first one, other than the pilot in June, is next week, the 28th. And we have, we have them scheduled for, in addition to next week's, we have it scheduled for September, one in late September, one in late October. Well, we've already got the dates picked. We don't have the topics picked yet. Um, and our intention is just to continue uh, doing one uh, on a monthly basis. At this point, we're anticipating that it would be a different topic each month. So going back to the, the pilot that we did in June, first, um, you know, we had some discussions, our, our team, there's five people on our team, and we struggled a little bit with the whole concept of innovation space, trying to understand and get a grasp on it. And um, in the course of that, I, I um, talked or emailed with Jan a little bit, and I got some clarification that helped me. It, it may or may not help other people, but the, just in terms of, of the context of an innovation space and what it's about and questions like, well, do you do more than one on the same topic? And these are the kinds of questions we were coming up with. So the understanding that I developed by talking with Jan and looking at the notebook, et cetera, is that actually I drew myself a little diagram, a circle, a circle, not unlike the circle in the, in the uh, uh, diagram we looked at at the beginning of this conversation. Um, and at the top is innovation space. And then at about 4 o'clock is planning. And at about 8 o'clock is doing. So innovation, it's kind of a continuous process as I understand it now. And, and Jan or Carlton or anybody can correct me. Um, but uh, you have an innovation space on whatever the topic may be. Uh, and of course, the innovation space is not about planning. But planning is something that can come out of an innovation space at, at, another, at a separate time. And then you would move from planning to doing. And then if it's appropriate, you come for, for I'm sorry, full circle and do another innovation space. It could be weeks or months down the road to say, OK, so we, we had an innovation space. We did some planning. We did some doing. Now where are we? And is it appropriate to? Uh, do some more brainstorming or more innovating. So getting that contact, I mean, whether that's on target or not, 
it, it was the understanding that I developed and it helped me just kind of get a grasp of the whole thing. So we went ahead with our uh, pilot innovation space and as I said we had 10 or 12 people from throughout the organization. Topic was circulation of ebooks. So we learned a few things. Um, one is that uh, it's, you know, it's one, as with anything else in life, it's one thing to read a book about it um, or even hear somebody talk about it and it's another thing to actually do it. And there are things that um, you can even read in a book or be told by somebody that it, this, is, this part of this is hard or challenging, but until you do it, you don't really know it. <clears throat> so w by doing our pilot, we saw, you know, in real life that, first of all, um, staying focused on the topic was a challenge. Um, uh, also, um, uh, not ma well, maintaining the distinction between uh, uh, an innovation space and planning was also a challenge. And both of those things um, sort of point to uh, um, facilitation skills. It, it so happened in our pilot that uh, we had somebody who's, whose facilitating skills were uh, not well developed. Um, so we, we, you know, found ourselves in a little bit of um, deep water, trying to stay focused on the topic and um, trying to not move into planning. But, you know, we kind of worked together and we got through it. And again, the spirit was, this is a pilot, this is the first time we're going to learn from doing this. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it, overall it went well. Um, uh, again, the, as it turned out, the topic itself was not that important. It was really, in this case, about the process. So I think we learned a lot about uh, how to do this. And as I've already explained, based on that, we went ahead with this plan of having them once a month starting next week. Uh, by the way, the topic for next week is going to be service to families. Um, the other thing I think, based on our experience with a pilot that we came out with is just the thought that um, uh, at least initially go for low-hanging fruit. You know, try to keep it simple. Every time we do this, we're going to learn uh, and we're going to learn how to do it better. And um, when we get a bunch of them under our belt, um, uh, we'll, we'll be in a much different place than we are now. Um, and uh, as we begin to do community conversations, that may we may then be able to connect to whatever we're learning um, through there, through that. So that's basically it. I'm glad to answer any questions that people may have. And so any questions for Richard? And I just might comment to the group the overview he gave about that they did an innovation space, uh, talked about what they're learning, uh, saw implications for acting, acting and thinking about coming back together in six months and saying, Okay, now where are we is spot on. So, um, pause on that um, insight. So, questions from anybody for um, Richard. Let me see. Mary's got one here. What sort of facilitation skills are most important? So, let me ask the, the people that have actually done this. Um, you know, Richard, um, Erica, Sean, uh, what is your thought about that? Well, this is Richard. Um, I don't think you need to be a world expert facilitator to do this, but um, some of the some of the basics of facilitating are important, and that is to some of those are to know know where you want to be by the end of the hour. I mean, basically, um, and just to keep in mind that as a facilitator, your job is to help the group get there. Um, uh, the facilitator should not be expressing his or her own opinion for the most part. The facilitator should be watching how the process is unfolding and seeing, well, is this going to get us where we need to be at the end of the hour? Or if there's, uh, there's nothing wrong with going off, off the path somewhat if, it, if it's a good and useful and productive way to do it and you're still going to basically accomplish your goal. So, you know, I see the facilitator as basically the person who's kind of driving the bus, but um, I, it's, it's really all about the participants. So I don't know if that helps at all. 
Yeah, so let me ask you another question, Richard. There's a question here about um, they can see how the, um, question, the four questions uh, could work well when thinking about community conversations, but they're um, trying to think about what are the, how do those questions work when you have a specific topic like e-books? E what are the kinds of things that come up? Well, that's a good question. I think, you know, keeping in mind that we've still only done one of these. Um, what we thought was that um, before we do the next one, and I'm sorry I didn't think to say this before, before we do the next one, we have to sit down and look at these questions and make sure that there's a basic fit here. And if we need to adapt the questions a little bit, then, then that's okay. Now, I'm, I'll also add, you know, one of the earlier speakers talked about the, the value of the process and we talked in Denver about the value of this process and, and sticking to it. So I'm, I'm sort of going on the assumption that, you know, a little bit of tweaking is okay. Um, but we did find that these questions maybe were not ideally suited to the kind of topic, um, I mean, the, the topic of circulation of ebooks could be called a kind of a specific and sort of library operations kind of topic. Um, so yeah, we're, we need to look at the questions before we do the next one and just make sure there's a good fit there. And, and if a little tweaking is needed, then, then we would do it. Our next topic, as I said, is service to families. That's quite a different kind of topic. Um, but that's something I'd be curious in uh, Jan or Carlton's um, thoughts about that. I mean, I really respect this process as it's laid out, but um, I'm assuming it's okay to do a little tweaking if it feels like it's necessary. Yeah, so let me um, go ahead, Jan. Uh, I, I, what I was going to say, Carlton, was you know the question about topics. Um, this was initially conceived of as an a way to actually focus on what we're learning about what we're learning as an organization and how to use what you're learning to create change. So in that sense, if you are if it's about a particular topic like ebooks, then it's because you want to learn about what uh, what are you learning about ebooks? What are the implications for how we're dealing with ebooks? What does that mean if we for creating change, et cetera? The, it is used very successfully to focus on the Harwood practice and what you are learning about change. So for example, you could have an innovation space on, um, OK, we tried the aspirations exercise three times. So uh, and we tried turning outward a couple of times or whatever. So what are we learning about using the Harwood tools so far? What are the implications of this? And as um, Erica and Sean have already described, once you've done some community conversations, it's a perfect opportunity to say, what are we learning from the community conversations? What are we learning about how to do community conversations effectively? And what are the implications of this? So I just I wanted to come back to what you had talked about, Richard, and, and the circle that you drew. It's really about you know the learning, planning, doing, learning cycle, right? And so it's really, really helpful when you are trying to learn a new practice like the Harwood practice to use innovation space to focus on the Harwood practice. It also can be a useful tool for focusing on anywhere in your library or system where you are trying to create change and what are you learning about that. So I'll stop there. Carlton, you wanted to speak? I was just going to ask if there, there's a few questions that are surfacing in the chat box. It looks like they're being answered by the group, so I don't know that we need to address them here. But let me just take a pause and see if um, anybody um, has a question they want to ask of um, Erica, Sean, or Richard before we move on. Or for that matter, if you have any questions about the first part of the webinar, which is on steps to holding innovation space. One thing that has come up here is uh, the notion of using them for a hardwood process and using them for other purposes, such as ebooks or other topics, 
And I'm going to be getting into that in just a few minutes. Uh, but the basic answer is, um, as Richard illustrated, you can use them for both purposes. Um, the initial training here that we're doing um, is just getting grounded and using innovation space, what it feels like, uh, what it looks like. And as you would, as you develop um, sort of a sense of what this looks like and how you can use it, um, it's quite often that people um, will say, well, we can use this for doing something else. And that's quite often where people go off and say, well, we can have an innovation space on a particular topic. Um, let me comment um, on one other thing. We're going to be trying in future webinars uh, to make the experience that people are having in the field as part of this process be part of the webinar. So I want to give thanks to Sean and Erica and Richard for being the first to get us started in this um, path. But just be aware as a group that Jan and I might be reaching out to you to be participants in upcoming webinars that we have, because we're going to try to make this as interactive as we can for folks. Um, so moving on, I, I'm going to move on to the next section. And we're going to pause after this. This is not going to be so much a section about specific steps to take. But this is going to be more around characteristics and things to watch for um, with innovation space. And then also focusing a little bit on some innovation behaviors and planning behaviors that you can keep in mind. Uh, so the first, there's uh, five characteristics of innovation space. And the first one, obviously, is up here on the screen. It's uh, the space itself. And um, you know this is making time for it on your schedule. Everybody's very busy. Uh, we know that. Um, creating space for another meeting is difficult. Um, so just merely a characteristic to watch for is, are you making space on your calendars? Is it being set aside for innovation space? And is it separate from other meetings or sessions? Uh, one thing we found is it's quite difficult to do an innovation space if you're going to tack it on to the end of a planning meeting. Um, it generally needs to have a meeting of, of its own, and that's because the norms that take place in an innovation space are very different than a planning meeting, which is the kind of meeting we most, most often have. So there are some questions on the slide that you can just ask yourself. Um, do you have time set aside on your calendars? Can you see that? Is it separate from meetings or other sessions? And are you holding the innovation spaces on a regular basis? And we suggest those as being once a month. Uh, but the thing I would emphasize is make it work for you. Everybody's context is very different, and how you define regular is really up to you. Don't think of four weeks once a month as prescriptive, but think of it as a suggestion based on experience of what we found to work for folks. The next characteristic of innovation space is really about um, that it's about sh a shared value and a shared venture. It's about the um, as uh, Sean and Eric and, and, and um, Richard talked about, it's, it's really creating a different kind of a space where it's about learning and insight and reflection. Uh, we suggest that the ground rules um, actually be um, brought out and reinforced each time, um, as opposed to um, putting them aside. I remind people about that. Um, if you have, are in a fortunate position that um, you have a space that you can actually do these in on a regular basis. One thing you might ask yourself is, could somebody walk into that space and see the norms and the ground rules posted? Um, a key question um, you can ask yourself here is, you know, is the space you're doing this reflect really the character of the kind of environment that you're trying to create? Another characteristic is that innovation space is done over time. Um, you know, as we've already talked, if you're new to doing an innovation space, it may take a bit of time for its value to be established. Um, it didn't sound like any of them have a, had a problem with its value being established right away. But sometimes we've found that if people use innovation space and they don't get to taking implications that lead to action from the time they've spent reflecting, um, people will sometimes wonder, what's the point in doing these? Um, so it's really important to think about um, over time, um, innovation takes root, and it takes root really based upon um, taking that time to reflect, but then having the reflection lead to implications that lead to action 
Um, and as Richard commented, coming back in six months and saying, okay, we did that, we learned, we took action, now where are we? And doing perhaps another innovation space. One thing you can ask yourself is um, to see if it's holding over time is, um, are the meetings being canceled when other pressures emerge? Um, that's kind of a tip that people aren't seeing value in it. Intentional, um, if people see in the organization, uh, in the organization see that people are talking about learning and drawing lessons, um, that's a sign that a culture of innovation is taking hold. It's really quite different than if the organizational culture is one about where people are always talking about doing. Uh, one way to encourage this kind of action is to bring lessons learned from innovation space into other meetings that you may be having. So you could think about other opportunities during the normal course of your work week where ideas that come up in innovation space would be um, relevant to bring into it and tell people, well, you know, we heard this came up in innovation space. We had this particular insight and it's relevant to the topic that we're having right now. Um, as we talked about earlier, innovation space can be used to reflect on something more specific. Uh, for example, your organization may have just launched a new initiative or it may have just completed a special project or it may have had just a really large grant um, that had you participate in this national initiative with libraries transforming communities and you might pause after that and say, you know, what did we learn? Um, what are the implications of what we learned? Why was it important? Where else could we use what we are learning? So you can use these um, both connected to the conversations you're having around what you're learning in the community, but you can also use them to talk about what you're learning as an organization with special projects or initiatives that you have in place. And the last one here, the last characteristic is step up. And um, every so often, take time to step back as a group and gauge how you're doing with innovation space. Um, you might, for example, ask participants to use the Harwood rating scale. Um, now, we didn't put the page number on that on this slide, unfortunately. Um, that was my mistake. But you'll find that on the innovation space um, sheet, uh, page 9.6 is the bottom of that has the Harwood rating scale. And you might simply use a Harwood rating scale against the questions that were posed for each of the previous characteristics. Are we holding innovation space on a regular basis? Could someone walk into the space and see that the norms and ground rules are posted? Could someone see the space operating over a period of time? Can you show how um, you are continually drawing lessons and ideas from innovation space? Are people in, um, actually engaged? So um, this is about periodically stepping back and really um, measuring the group's performance in terms of uh, the innovation space itself. So I want to pause at this point and just see if there's any questions on this last section. Oh, and there's one from Erica and Brent. Um, mm -hmm. At what point should we think about turning outward and engaging the community in the process? So I think that that is an excellent question. And if my suggestion would be is as people hold community conversations, as they do ask exercise, as they do aspirations, you know, you're going to uncover people that want to turn outward, that are naturally turned outward, that are having a, you get a sense of who has the community as a reference point for wanting to create change. And you might think, um, we're going to get into this a little bit in the partnership webinar, but you might think about, you know, who shares our aspirations? Who, who wants to work with us to move this idea of engaging the community to get people working together towards common shared aspirations? Um, and there's nothing wrong with thinking about, you know, who wants to be a partner with us in it. Um, we're going to be, as I said, talking about that more in the, in the partnership webinar. The key question to ask yourself really is, are they turned outward and will they work on shared aspirations? Um, this gets very much into the point of whether the organization is about the organization first or whether they're about the community first. Um, and as I said, we're going to get into that in the partnership webinar. But when you start to uncover some of those people, um, there's a place that you can make them part of an um, innovation space. 
The other thing that can come up is um, I know of organizations that now have several innovation spaces going on in several different departments within the organization because they got started in one place and then another department decided we could use this in our own set in a, the own area of our work. So um, let me know if that answers you. Type back if that answers your question, um, Erica and Brent. Right. Uh, this is Jan. Let, let, me just, Jan? Um, let me just uh, build on what you have said. In a sense, um, you are already turned outward toward the community by virtue of, I think it was Erica and that team that have been doing the ask exercise door to door. I can't remember if it was Erica or whether it was the other team. You, that, that action in and of itself is turning outward towards the community and you are engaging the community already. The next step of engagement will be getting back to them and telling them what you're learning from community conversations, which would ideally be in the form of a uh, community narrative slash mad lib. That's another way of engaging them and keeping them engaged. And the third way will be when you begin to share the public knowledge after you've done the eight to 10 community conversations and themed and developed a community narrative. And that, as Carlton had just said, that will help you think about uh, partners existing and potential and um, is, again, an example of turning outward towards the community. Thanks. So I hope, so. hopefully that helps as well. So I'm not seeing any other questions right now. Um, feel free to type them in if you have some, but I'll move on to the next set of slides here. Um, what we're going to do now is um, talk a little bit about some behaviors that can be useful to consider. Um, and there are nine of these behaviors, which I'm going to be listing on two slides. Um, and what we've done here is list innovation and planning behavior side by side so you can get a sense of the difference and the implications for the way we work. Um, for example, look at the first horizontal pairing. Um, sometimes, um, and I imagine all of you have run the, into this, organizations have a culture where they feel every possible implication for any idea must be addressed and concluded before any action is taken. And while this can be, minimize risk and avoid failure, an excessive focus on certainty to avoid failure or, or even the appearance of failure can stifle innovation. Innovation, on the other hand, embraces trial and error and is always about learning. I'm not going to speak to each one of these pairings at this point, but I merely want to give you a few moments to read them over and consider them. And what I'd like to encourage you to do is to come back um, to these following this webinar so you as an individual or as your team has an idea of some behaviors to watch for. So just take a minute now and read through these. And these are paired side by side. I'll give you just another minute. And now I'll move on to the next set of behaviors to watch for. Again, these are listed side by side, so you have a sense of the difference of behaviors for an innovation and planning mindset. So the next thing we're going to uh, move on to after this is a quick review of gauging success and tips for common questions. But before moving on to that, let me answer a question about um, access to these. Um, right now, they're just in this set of slides. Um, I'll put them onto a separate document and get those posted to the um, ALA Connect site so they're easy to download for, for yourself.
And I would encourage well, you also. Go ahead. Uh, Brian has already offered to do that, Carlton, on our behalf. Oh, great. And the other thing I was going to just encourage folks is to take a look at these and think about them and bring them into the coaching calls that Jan and I have with you. The reason for putting in these in here is more of tips for some things that you can look at to sort of really assess um, the kind of cultural behaviors that are going on in your organization. Um, and you can be sort of on the lookout for the for the turn the innovation, which is more turned outward, and the planning, which is more turned inward type behaviors. So gauging success. Um, this slide really captures some key questions that you can ask yourself to gauge how your application of innovation space is going for yourself. Um, we've covered many of these items in previous slides and um, have placed them here merely as an easy reference for yourself. So you can ask yourself, have we set aside a dedicated time for innovation space? Is that on our calendars? Is it a safe space with clear ground rules? And when I, by safe, I mean, is it a safe, safe space where we feel that we can share, that we can reflect, um, and that it's, it embraces really the ground rules of the conversation where everybody participates, nobody dominates, everybody's participation is valued. Um, are, we, are we sticking with this and keeping this space open over time? Um, even if you run into a struggle and things aren't working quite right, are you sticking with it? Um, are we continually drawing lessons from our work? Are we applying what we're learning? Do we check in and discuss the group's performance from time to time? Are we creating a culture of accountability? And by that we mean when you have implications from learning, and that leads to actions. Are the people that are supposed to be taking action, are they actually doing it? And then coming back so you can talk about it. Um, does the space include others in this work from different parts of the organization? So you might think about, you know, if you're going to move forward as an, uh, as an organization, are there certain people that you need in an innovation space to be part of this with you? Are they there? Um, that's what's meant by that last one. Now we're moving on to the, really the close of the webinar and with a slide of questions that we suggest that you ask yourself every six months in an innovation space. Um, and again, we've covered ma many of these on previous slides, but the purpose here is to step back and we're suggesting one six months and basically ask yourself the intentionality tests. Um, you all have these in the binder um, and um, you know, are we turned outward to the community? Are our actions rooted in people's shared aspirations? Um, can you uh, stand on the table and talk to people about their aspirations and concerns and about the community, what they believe us? You can read these questions here, but we're suggesting that once every six months, and this is in the Innovation Space Guide on page 9.6, as is on the slide, just take uh, the Use Your Innovation Space to ask yourself these intentionality tests. And a few tips for the facilitator. Um, so one thing you might consider to encourage people um, is to consider to, is to encourage people before the meeting to bring a topic with them. Um, if you recall back in Denver, at least in the group that I had, um, when we started the innovation space, it's not uncommon for there to be a little bit um, silence and people be tentative in getting started. But once they get started, you really get on a roll with it. And uh, one thing that can help is encourage people to bring a topic with them. Uh, you might, for example, um, hear somebody on the innovation space team share something they learned that you think is significant um, during the course of the normal week. Um, you know, make note of this and encourage them to share it when you get um, in the innovation space. And that is a way that you can sort of get the fuel to get the conversation going. A facilitator also might do a process check as the hour passes by. If the group seems to be done on questions about learning and implications, ask if there are any additional learnings not yet addressed before moving on to the next question. Think about encouraging those who have not shared to add something or see if there are any questions about a point raised before. If the group is at a halfway mark and still going strong on learning, you might pause for time, a time check and indicate to the group that you can continue on with the learnings, but that you'll need to still need time at the end where you can harvest um, what you've learned. Uh, you may need to schedule an, an additional innovation space. Um, if you find the group moving into a planning mode, as we've talked about before, 
uh, pause, write the idea on a parking lot flip chart, but stay focused on learning as, as opposed to specific actions. And some tips for uh, sharing roles. Um, what I mean by this is different people bring different skills with them. Um, some will be good facilitators, others may be good note takers, still others may be particularly strong at following up with those that were unable to attend. Um, the idea here is for your group to be open to trial and error and developing your capacity as a team and identifying where participants fit. Um, and that means basically you're going to be better prepared as a team in an organ as um, people come and go in an organization. Uh, what happens, for example, if you become overly dependent on one person uh, being the facilitator or a note taker and that person is no longer available to participate? Does that cause a pause in you even being able to have innovation space? So think about sharing roles, giving people, different people an opportunity to assume those roles and not necessarily just depending on one person to do them. The tips in, on note taking are not really going to be anything that's terribly new for you. Um, it's basically, I would suggest you revisit the guidance in the community conversation uh, workbook. Uh, the note taker is looking for not so much a transcript, um, they're looking to capture meaning and they're looking to capture key insights. Um, the note taker is careful to make note about learning where learning can be applied. And this is where it becomes important to consider if you have different departments or parts of the organization represented. So a common thing that comes up is uh, when everybody can't make a particular meeting, do you pause and hold until everybody can get there? And we suggest really that you think about innovation space as being porous. Um, some of the things that um, you can think about uh, for handling people that come and go is really developing a culture of shared learning so that even if a participant is not able to attend, they can still be aware of key learnings and implications that were, that were surfaced. So in um, Columbus's ca case, I believe they said that they posted the notes to a Dropbox account that everybody could see. That's a great idea. You may have another technique for doing that. Um, the idea here is that you might um, consider a mechanism where if somebody can't make it, they have an opportunity to catch up, see what went on. You might be um, in a situation where you say, you know, I'll follow up with this person and let them know what we talked about. Um, consider the space porous, and by that I mean, you know, if somebody can't make it, that's okay, keep moving forward. But if they um, aren't able to make it more often than, they're, than they are, that really might raise the question of, are they really committed to participating in the innovation space? So you want to see them more there more often than not. And this is, relates a little bit to keeping space when time gets tight. Um, the key step I would suggest here is don't leave an innovation space meeting without having your next one can, um, scheduled. If you leave it and say, well, we'll follow up and we'll schedule it um, in the next week, uh, it's not unusual for that to pass for two weeks. Uh, you'll need another three or four weeks before you can get it on the calendar. Then it becomes something that you're not doing every six weeks, and it really starts to lag at that point. So bring your calendars with you and be prepared to set the next meeting. Uh, Richard suggested that they already have several um, scheduled out and booked, and I would say that's an excellent practice. If you can do that, that would be great. Um, the other thing is honoring time when people know that they can count on an hour instead of it becoming an hour and a half or an hour and 20 minutes. Um, they know they can count on an hour and it's easier for people to make a commitment and stick with it when that happens. Um, the, the last thing is make the time count that you're together. And that's really about, you know, as we said, focus on learning, focus on the insight, the reflections, but be sure to give time for implications and talk about um, how those implications need to play themselves out in terms of um, accountability and actions that come out of the innovation space. Yes. Carlton, uh, there was yes. a question from Jean, Jean from Springfield. Um, please clarify difference between, quote, where the learning can be applied, unquote, versus planning. Okay, so um, let me move back to that one. 
Um, I'm not sure which slide that was. I think she but, said um, it's from, from the previous slide on note taking, I think. So just let me see if I can find it too. Yeah. Uh, slide 27, I think, tips for note taking. OK. When we talk about where the learning can be applied, um, you may have a conversation that has um, an insight um, where you might say something like, well, somebody needs to know this. Um, I'll, let me give you an example from another group we worked with. Um, there was an innovation space done by a number of community people um, where they learned something in conversations that had nothing to do with their organizations, but it had something to, and they, this particular group wasn't dealing in the area of healthcare, but they learned something about healthcare, and they said, this is important for somebody else to know. And that's the place where you might want to say where there's an application for somebody. Um, we talked about in a previous webinar having community conversations where the idea of police came up, where people um, were being, um, police were ignoring people that were being um, um, victims of violence in a particular neighborhood. And the insight um, from that really was, you know, somebody in police needs to know. But we also had a conversation about being very careful in terms of who we took that to, because sometimes police always aren't the most trusted people. And you have to be quite discerning. But quite often what happens in innovation space is you'll talk about learning, you'll have insights that are shared, and then from those insights, you might have as simple a simple thing as, well, you know, somebody in the HR department needs to know about this, or somebody in accounting needs to know about this, or this is something that came up that somebody in the reference department would be useful to know. And that's where you get into um, taking a learning from an innovation space and moving it forward to a space where somebody that there's an implication for somebody where an action should be taken. Jan, is there anything you want to add to that? I think so, Carlton. I think you've done a nice job of describing it. I could just add other examples, but we just have a few minutes left, so if we get time, I can come back to that. Jean, I'm hoping that answered your question. Yeah, so um, yeah, we are reaching to the close here, but before we close, and um, I would just like to say that um, I would encourage any of you that have additional questions uh, um, as a result of this webinar, just reach out to Jan or I. Um, and we're more than happy to um, try to get you answers and respond to the things that um, surface for you as you leave this webinar. Um, I don't know about you, but quite often I go through something like this and I end up having questions a half an hour later and I say, darn, I wish I would have asked that. So don't hesitate to reach out to us. Um, our next webinar is on partner selection on September 24th. And I would encourage folks um, that have partnership policies um, to please share those on the ALA Connect site and give some thought to how those policies you have um, and the Harwood practice might intersect. Um, doing that's going to make that webinar um, a little bit more tangible and, and more on point. So please get those up there. And um, some of you already have, so I appreciate that. Um, our next coaching calls, um, I believe you have this, but it's September 3 with Jan, uh, September 4th with me for our groups. And uh, we have, I believe everybody has our dial-in numbers and their additional updates that are being posted on ALA Connect on a pretty regular basis. Um, I would, there's a question here about a deadline for posting the partnership um, policies. And I would say, you know, it would be really useful to me if you could get those up. Um, really by the close of this week would be really helpful. Um, if you could do it at the end of no later than the middle of next week, say Wednesday, um, it would be very much appreciated. Uh, there's a little bit of preparation that Jan and I put into these things, and having those in advance would be helpful to us. So let's say shoot for this Friday and no later than next Wednesday. Any other questions from folks? 
So I think with that, our webinar for this particular session is over. And thank you very much. Yes, thanks everybody. And as Carlton said, bring any questions you have into our next coaching call um, in a week and a half or so, um, because these things will percolate. And thanks, Sean, Erica, and Richard for the time you took to share your experience with everybody. Yes.